first happy to welcome our second speaker of this session. So Jayandra Soni, who does not need uh, any introduction yet, um, let us say that um, not only he has uh, extensively written on earlier giant authors such as uh, Umas Vati uh, and Kunda Kunda, uh, but also uh, is working on later authors such as Prabhachandra and Vidyanandi, in which there should be way more references to Buddhism, uh, I, I guess. So um, Professor Soni today will offer us a presentation on the Digambara Vidyanandi Vid Sorry, Vidyanandin's discussion with the Buddhists on uh, Svasamvedana, Pratyaksha, and Pramana. So thank you. Where am I? Uh, yeah. Thank you. In F F5, if you want to carry it. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not, not in this case. So thank you very much indeed. It is always a pleasure to be here and even a great honor. This presentation is a continuation of a short study that in 1999 was one of the earliest, albeit brief, textual studies on the scholar monk Vidyanandin of the 10th century. It was based on a small section of his commentary, the Tattvartha Shloka Vartika, on Umaswati's Tattvartha Sutra 1.6. Unfortunately, I do not have to say anything more about the Tattvartha Sutra. The paper at that time dealt mainly with Vidyanandin's rejection of the Buddhist view that only parts of an object are directly open to perception and that the object as a whole cannot be cognized in an unmediated way. In order to better follow the context in which Vidyanandin dealt with the theme, I had briefly discussed some aspects of the problem with reference to Dharmakirti because Vidyanandin quotes him. Dharmakirti, on the other hand, is unthinkable without Dignaga, and further, when dealing with universals and particulars, the views of these two Buddhist giants also had to be briefly contrasted with the Nyaya Vaisheshika perspective, which I did. Vidyanandin's commentary on this sutra entails a total of 56 shlokas with a prose vartika on each in varying various lengths, ranging from a line or two to a couple of pages, sometimes combining shlokas, mainly two of them together. In 1999, I had dealt with the first 10 shlokas and the vartikas, showing how Vidyanandin sees the pramanas and nayas as respectively yielding a knowledge of the universal and of the particular, for which he uses the synonymous pairs amsha, amshin, avayava, and avayavi, arguing that an object as a whole from the Jaina point of view is no less real than its visible parts. I am now today limiting myself here to some aspects related to the concept of Svasamvedana, Pratyaksha, and Pramana in his commentary to this Sutra 1.6. I am particularly keen on knowing where Vidyanandin obtained his basic ideas from, which allowed him to effectively direct them against the Buddhists. In vindicating the statement of the Sutra he is commenting on, Vidyanandin emphasizes the point that, the, that a pramana is not a naya because they serve two separate epistemological functions. In objecting to the Buddhist view, Vidyanandin appeals finally to perception, which the Buddhist also accepts as a pramana, and clenches the argument by saying at the end, 
the object as a whole is clearly perceived as a single gross object like its parts. In his lengthy Vartika to this stanza, Vidyanandin immediately then goes on to tell the Buddhist that the notion of an object as a whole is not a superimposed conceptual or mental construction. It is not a kalpana, meaning thereby that the object as a whole really exists. It was here that I located two quotations from Dharmakirti's Pramana Vartika. In commenting on this sutra, Vidyanandan is obviously adopting a position that by his time became traditional about pramana furnishing a cognition that is comprehensive and naya a limited one in determining its object only partially. Indeed, he's indebted to his predecessors for this insight and such a debt is not unique to Vidyanandin because it is found in practically all the Indian traditions. This debt, however, takes on a special significance when in the spirit of discussion and debate, it is further developed and used effectively to contest an idea or an opponent and not merely utilized to simply explain a concerned point. Vidyanandin seizes the opportunity to apply some of his predecessors' insights when debating with the Buddhists and the others. So for our purposes now, let us briefly see what Umaswati, Pujyapada, and Akalanka say on this very same sutra in order to set this record straight with regard to Vidyanandin's reliance on them. This I had omitted previously. In his auto-commentary to the Tattvata Sutra 1.6, Umaswati says that both the twofold pramanas, so paroksha and pratyaksha, and the nayas, negama, etc., will be dealt with later. Hence, here, there is nothing significant by Umaswati on his own sutra. Vidyanandin only defends it and is indebted to him for the sutra itself. Pujapada is a bit more specific in his Sadvarta Siddhi commentary to the sutra where he strives in a brief way to draw a clear distinction between the crucial terms in the sutra, pramana and naya. Pujapada begins by saying that pramana is mentioned first in the sutra because it is more important than the word naya with lesser syllables. And here he's showing the acquaintance, his acquaintance with Panini. He then makes a special effort to clearly distinguish between the roles, saying that a pramana cognizes an object as a whole, and naya only its specific state, namely a part of it. So it is clear that Vidyanandin utilizes this point against the Buddhists. This is what Pujapada says in a part of his commentary to Tattvata Sutra 1.6. It has been said, after grasping an object through pramana, naya determines the object, object accurately according to its specific state. Further, a pramana grasps the object as a whole, Thus, it has been said, pointing out the whole rests on a pramana, pointing out a part of it rests on naya. I'm interested in these two quotations that Pujapada gives. The Hindi commentary and explanatory translation says that they are agama quotations. What is intriguing for me is that the first of these is no longer retained, kept alive, but the second one is. And I meant showing this to you because perhaps some of you recognize from which Agama it might be. Pujapada then goes on to talk about Naya, 
Dravyar Tikanea and Padyal Tikanea, omitting Gunar Tikanea. And he says at the end of what I'm showing you here, all these Dravya, Padyaya, and the aspects related to them are to be known through Pramana. So Naya is to be known through Pramana. <clears throat> Vidyanandin obviously relies on Puja Pada for this basic view that the Pramanas and Nayas are different in their roles, as the Sutra himself, itself implies, and also that these roles can be insightfully associated with the knowledge of universals and particulars, respectively. It is interesting that in his Sarvata Siddhi commentary, Puja Pada speaks of the two Nayas. Dravyartika Naya on Pariyartika Naya. And the question is how to relate these to universals and particulars. What is the difference between, for example, Pramana grasping the object as a whole and the Naya called Dravyartika Naya? At the end of the quotation, Puja Pada says that the Nayas are to be known through pramana. We know that in Jainism, a dravya, its guna, and its pariyaya thematically belong together. So substance quality and its mode or modification. Puja Pada takes these into consideration when commenting on the sutra by clearly distinguishing between the roles of the pramanas and the nayas whenever these were first mentioned in the Jaina tradition. The statements attributed to the Agamas have not been identified. And for my purpose, this is all I want to say about Puja Pada. <clears throat> Perhaps we can talk about that more in the discussion. Akalanka's commentary, the Tatvartha, the Rajavartika on this sutra is in five pages divided into 14 sections of the critical editions that I used, and is thus more elaborate than Puja Pada. <clears throat> In section three, Akalanka repeats Puja Pada's second unidentified quotation, but omits Puja Pada's quotation beginning Ragriha Pramanata. It is noteworthy that in his Tatvata Shloka Vartika, Vidyanandin also omits the one quotation, but refers to the other and comment, commenting on the same sutra in his Vartikas to 1621 to 1645, and also in other places, for example, Ashta Sahastri, Yuktianu um, Shasana Tika, in two places. So, how do I know about all these places? And it might be interesting for you to know. Uh, that I wish to thank Himal Trika for this information. He has a, a very valuable resource, the digital corpus of Vidyanandin's works. It enables a search for a word, a phrase, or parts of them. The search function is generally made available online. So I thank him for his help here. In the last section, Akalanka uses the word Trayakara, the threefold form of the grasper, the appearance of the object, and the role of consciousness. His commentary here is very brief, and I wonder whether he is hinting at a crucial issue in Yogacara epistemology, namely the doctrine of Trisvabhava, dealing with the triple nature of existence and the problem of reality and appearance, with the intricate discussion of the status of the object in relation to the manner in which it is known, namely the distinction between the object out there and the object as it is known. <clears throat> Akalanka is evidently presenting the Buddhist view that consciousness, vidyana, bears or carries in itself only the form, the akara of the object, and not the object itself, which is out there. 
The word samviti, which he uses, is a synonym for samvedana, or awareness. And sva samvedana, or self-awareness, is involved in the mechanism of how we cognize things, and it implies that cognition is self-valid. It does not need another cognition for its admissibility and legitimation. Vidyanandin takes up these points in his commentary to the Sutra in more detail than Akalanka, as we shall see. Akalanka also briefly deals with other views, and the general trend of his commentary seems to be that the Jainas are not irrational and that their ideas are compatible with those of Sankhya, Vaisheshika, and the Buddhist. Akalanka implies, as the key words to section 14 say, that neither the Buddhist nor the others can object to Jaina views because there is no incompatibility in all the utterances. It seems here that in this commentary to Tattvata Sutta 1.6, Akalanka is unusually conciliatory in saying that the Jaina views can be reconciled with what the others say. This conciliatory tone applies probably only in the context of the mechanism of the process of knowing what we know, not in the ontological context of there being a permanent conscious principle, the jiva, which for the jainas in the final analysis enables cognition and a knowledge of the jaina siyadvada. Vidyadandin is much more forthright in, in his commentary and even more detailed on the same sutra. And although one can see his debt to his immediate predecessors, especially Akalanka and Puja Pada, it is clear that he adds other insightful dimensions to the ideas related to epistemology and ontology and to the Buddhist position itself. It is known that several ideas in Buddhism are not uniform. For example, the concept of Sva Samvedana, the definition of Mano Vidyana, and its relation to Manasa Pratyaksha, to name but just two. The concept of Alaya Vidyana in Yogacara would be an added topic in Buddhism. To obtain a clear picture of the development of these ideas and other intricate details in Buddhism, and to back them up by textual evidences, is even for the Buddhist scholar a major task. It demands a thorough study not only of the Gnaga and Dharmakirti, but also of Vasubandhu and the Sautantrika influences apart from Nyaya Vaisheshika. With a basic acquaintance of the Buddhist ideas, I am trying now to follow Vidyanandin's main line of argument. What I'm attempting here is to see how in, he interprets specific Buddhist ideas and not to investigate how his presentation of them may or may not correspond to a Buddhist text or tradition he might be referring to. It is well known that in Indian scholarship, ideas are often mentioned just for the sake of argument and are not necessarily direct quotations. You are lucky if you find a couple of them. Often the Purva Paksha is not clearly identifiable. Moreover, it seems that at times, Vidyanandin springs quickly between the major ideas of Madhyamika and Yogacara perhaps even including Sautantika nuances. Further, the shades of differences among them without specific references makes the task of following Vidyanandin all the more difficult and complicated. Once again, I'm confronted with the thought that Jaina philosophy without an insight into the other schools is incomplete 
and indeed vice versa, that the study of the other school will be incomplete without also stating Jaina ideas either as a contribution or as a critique. The term Svarsam Vedana, with its synonym Svarsam Vitti, is indeed a complex one, and the dictionary meaning is knowledge derived from the self. In its technical application, it is variously translated as self-apprehension, self-cognition, or self-awareness. It also seems to be generally accepted that the concept of self-awareness is by no means uniform in the Buddhist tradition. The main thrust in interpreting it is that self-awareness entails a cognition of itself that cognition is aware of itself as cognizing an, obje an object, and that this cognition itself is the result, the pala, of cognition. A special issue of the Journal of Indian Philosophy was dedicated to the topic of Svar Samvedana in 2010, edited by Birgit Kellner. Among the thought-provoking articles in it is one by Dan Arnold. And I cannot help withholding a footnote I wrote in this presentation here, where I say that his article seems to have an anachronistic starting point and is like the proverbial cart being put before the horse. Dan Arnold says, on page 329. We can then usefully equip ourselves with some conceptual tools for reading Dignaga and his Indian followers and critics by briefly considering Franz ben Brentano and David Hume to exemplify certain aspects of a perceptual understanding of self-awareness and by then considering the sense it makes to say that one of Kant's main transcendental arguments against Hume is in the servant service of an essentially constitutive understanding thereof. And I must say that without the smattering of Buddhism that I have, I wouldn't have understood his perceptual understanding and his constitutive understanding. Should, not, should one not rather say that Dignagas and Dharmakirti's conceptual tools help in understanding Brentano and the others when one reads or reads it, rereads him, especially when one tries to make fruitful comparisons? Anyway, this just by way of an aside. The key term, Svar Samvedana, is unmediated direct cognition. It is a kind of pratyaksha, and it is said to have been introduced into debates on logic and epistemology by Dignaga in the fifth or sixth century. It was further developed and elaborated by Dharmakirti soon thereafter. Since then, it continued to occupy a prominent place in the debate on epistemological matters not only specifically for Buddhism, but also for Indian thought generally. Vasubandhu's earlier works also feature prominently in Buddhist epistemology since the time of Dharmakirti and Dignaga. Without going into the details of the differences with regard to Dignaga and Dharmakirti, and there are several differences between them, we can note here Dharmakirti's four kinds of direct cognition, each being called a specific type of pratyaksha. There is a big debate about whether these four are also traceable in Dignaga. The 
The four pratyakshas that he mentions are Indriya Pratyaksha, Manasa Pratyaksha, Sva Samvedana Pratyaksha, and Yogi Pratyaksha. So I am, of course, interested in Sva Samvedana Pratyaksha, which is self-awareness, for example, of desire, anger, ignorance, pleasure and pain, and also as a self-awareness of every cognition. Let us delve into perception a little bit. Pratyaksha is by and large the cognition derived through the sense organs and their respective objects, seen generally as being direct without anything intermediary between the object and the perception of it. The senses, the indriyas, are the instruments through which the perception takes place, enabling us to cognize and identify the object as such and such a thing. However, the instruments themselves, the indriyas, cannot be said to account for the cognition as such, namely for the knowledge, for the prama or the pramiti, of the object as something. For this, consciousness needs to be acknowledged, a conscious principle that is inalienably associated with the cognition process. The crux of the matter is that Vidyanandin, in this commentary to this sutra, is using the generally accepted view that the entire Pratyaksha process is a direct one and regarded by all schools as the only unmediated means of cognition, and that it is the basis of all other means, like anumana and so on. You need pratyaksha even when you use anumana as a pramana. In the debate, it is assumed in the background, so in Vidyanandin's background, and indirectly thematized here, that for the Jainas, cognition finally takes place because of the inalienable role of the jiva. When Vidyanandin de deals with Sva Samvedana in his commentary to the Sutra, he leaves out the intricacies of Manasa Pratyaksha, which has been referred to as a conundrum in the Buddhist, Buddhist Pramana system, and about which there is an ongoing concern, also in the special issue that I mentioned. Vidyanandin sees Sva Samvedana as the most important kind of Pratyaksha Pramana, highlighting it not only because it is the basis of every cognition, but also to bring out the element of consciousness intrinsically associated with it when we cognize an object. In this sense, he is taking the compound Sva Samvedana as a genitive Tat Purusha to mean an awareness of oneself, of the conscious principle, which is responsible for the awareness at all, an awareness of its inalienable role Finally, in epistemological matters, the status of the external object is crucial for both the Jainas and the Buddhists. The Jainas are realists, and so they acknowledge the existence of the external object allied with their acceptance of universals and particulars, which are also revealed in cognition. As for the Buddhists, the matter is quite complex and complicated. Matthew Kapstein, I hope that he would be here, gives a succinct account of the issues involved in the inquiry into our knowledge of the external world. He says, while Dignaga held that the objects of our perceptions are particulars bearing unique characteristics, his concept of the particular becomes the point of departure of a number of difficult questions. Is the object that we perceive actually something that exists out there in the world just as we perceive it? Or is it 
or is the object something that arises within our sensory field, perhaps corresponding to an external object that served as a stimulus, but not in fact identical to it? Or is the object exclusively an object of consciousness on the basis of which we construct the idea of an external world that does not exist in reality? As depressing as what this all demands in our study of Vidyanandin with regard to the Buddhist, let us in any case see how all these aspects that I dealt with above are encapsulated in three shlokas of Vidyanandin's commentary to this Tathagata Sutra 1.6, where the word Svasamvedana occurs. We barely have time now to briefly look at them in concluding this work in progress. Vidyanandin says, if the pratyaksha, that is Svarsamvedana, is the only real pratyaksha, then why is there no proof for a sentient principle which has the form of amsha amshin? The reference to Amsha Amshin, I think, is a reference to Dravya, Guna, and Paryaya, which applies not only to Jiva Dravya, but also to Ajiva Dravya. The second shloka where the word appears is, if even the accumulated knowledge is such an error, then what is without error? because otherwise the evident self-awareness would not make known the cognition and the atoms out of which the object is made up. This in itself would be a theme for the paper. And my final example of how we use Svartam Vedana is like the external objects here, in our cognition of the objects of the world, self-awareness is never what is bereft of the parts which make up the whole, because perception makes known the one thing with its parts, both the external and internal objects. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for, for your lecture. And uh, yeah, I think that the project to tackle the many, many consequences of the in integration of a non-realist stance into a realistic one uh, is a fascinating project. So uh, is there any question on this? Or I, I myself have has to process a bit <laughs> on this. So yes, you, you do have a... The whole point is, what is real? Yeah. Uh, as far as the Jains are concerned, there's no problem about it. But when you are comparing it with the Buddhist, yeah. then you are getting into a maze of different positions. I think we, if we take just Vidyanandin as a Jaina alone, mm -hmm. we have no problem. Yeah. But uh, he discusses and that's where we end up with all this trouble. Um, yeah. uh, are there other questions? We have two minutes uh, left. Then, uh, yeah. According to the definition that is given in the Sankhya it was mentioned, whatever does not have consciousness. Because that means there's only one real world and that's what we call it. <laughs> According to the... It's limited to the 
job. So this table, for example, would be regarded as unconscious. Regarded as a thing. Yeah. through the jivas that inhabit them. So the body is material. It becomes animated through the jiva, the conscious element that is in a living being. That would be the distinction. If there is no living being, then the object is inanimate. Uh, I'm only presenting to you what the Indian thinkers say. Okay, last quick, yeah. Okay, thank you very much again. And no, last but not least, our uh, youngest um, and very promising scholar is um, to close this day. I'm most happy to welcome um, my colleague Hélène de Jonker, uh, starting a PhD uh, in Ghent University with Eva de Klerk. Uh, on the conception of the other in Jainism. And today she will talk about the examination of the Buddhists in Amitagati's Dharma Pariksha, a reflective look on Jaina criticism. Okay, so thank you all for still being here and thank you, Peter, for letting me speak so early in my uh, PhD. So you, you notice that um, my title has changed a bit and also the content since I've written the abstract because I, at that time I was still really uh, starting with uh, the whole thing. Um, so as we all know, the Jain tradition never developed in an isolated environment, but instead was confronted with and influenced by all sorts of ideas and practices that were circulating in the subcontinent. Many texts give evidence of these contacts between the Jain and other traditions, be it oppositional or not. Um, the Dharma Pariksha, on which lies the focus of my PhD, is an example of how the Jains dealt with their others, especially um, with the dominant Hindu tradition. More specifically, this text deals with the Hindu um, Puranic and epic stories by criticizing them in a satirical way. As such, the text can be placed in a tradition of the Jain Puranas and Jain versions of Mahabharata and Ramayana. Other than this, the um, Dharma Pariksha is also often compared to the Dhurta Kyana by Haribhadra because next to having a similar content and structure, both texts are somewhat special in that they are satirical towards religion, which is not that common or does not seem to be that common in the, Jain, in the Indian tradition. Um, using stories and satire to criticize other religious traditions, the Dharma Pariksha was most likely to be read or uh, to be heard by a Jain lay audience with the goal of converting them or directing them back on the correct path. 
Of the um, Dharma Pariksha exist several versions written from at least the 10th century onwards by Digambara Jains. Um, and there are also some later Shvetambara versions. The oldest one was composed in Apabramsha by Harishena in 988 of the Common Era. Um, but Harishena himself states that he based his work on an older version by a certain Jayarama. But up till now, this text has not been found. The most popular version of the Dharma Pariksha is the text by Amitagati, written in Sanskrit in 1014 of the Common Era. And this text is also probably based on the same text as Harishina's text was based. And manuscripts of this, this uh, Sanskrit composition can be found in many collections all over India, or at least North India. And it's supposedly also the basis on which later versions um, have inspired their version. The later versions were written up to the 18th century in Sanskrit, Hindi, Gujarati, and even Kannada. They seem to have more or less the same content and differ only in language and style. And for this paper, I will only focus on the texts by Harishena and by Amitagati. The Dharma Pariksha consists of a frame story into which many smaller stories are embroidered. And it tells a story about two Vidyadharas, uh, Vidya or genie possessing humans with the ability to fly in search for the truth, at least according to the Jain religion. One Vidyadhara called Manu Vega is concerned about his friend, Pavana Vega, um, because Manu Vega is uh, a devoted Jain, and it seems that Pavana Vega has diverged from the right religious path. So in search for help to get his friend back on the right track, he goes to um, Pat, no, he goes to, so he comes down from his mountain and he goes to Ujjain, where he meets a Jain monk, Jinamati. Hearing Manu Vega's problem, Jinamati invites him to go to Pataliputra, a city dominated by Brahmins, portrayed as experts of the Hindu scriptures. There, Manu Vega engages in discussions with the Brahmins, proceeding from incredible stories he makes up about his life. What happens is that for every story, the two Vidyadharas take up a different form, as Vidyadharas are able to, before entering the city, the city, thus playing a different character. So upon entering Pataliputra, they are approached by Brahmins who ask them who they are, upon which Manavega replies them with an incredible story from his supposed life. When the Brahmins do not believe him, he justifies his story by referring to parallel episodes from the Hindu Puran, Puranas or from the Hindu epics. And in this way, he proves the inconsistency of Puranic Hinduism. After every such discussion, the Vidyadharas go outside of the city where Manu Vega explains to Pavana Vega some didactic passages on the Jain doctrine. In the end of the Dharma Pariksha, Pavana Vega is, ex is uh, converted and he accepts the vow of a Jain layman. So from this plot, it's clear that the real venom um, of the Dharma Pariksha was directed towards the Hindu tradition. It were the Brahmins about which the Jain audience had to know that they had to write the wrong ideas of right and wrong, the wrong, um, uh, yes, the wrong conduct and the wrong stories also. And this is made clear in the several sub-stories where we are told about Madhukara, uh, the Tomara king and the cow, a servant and the alloway, four fools, and then the Pulinda and his cat, etc. Stories that are afterwards compared with Puranic or epic stories, such as the story of Yama and Chaya, the sacrifice of Ravana, the birth of Vyasa, etc. And then in the end of the text, in the second to last story, we find, um, we find a story in which two Buddhists are staged. Um, this is the case both in the text by Amitagati as it is in uh, the text by Harishena. Because the text is about criticizing the Brahmins, we might be wondering why exactly the author chose to stage people from other religious affiliations or why the author on which they base their composition chose to do this. Um, staging religious others, other than the Brahmins, has no real functionality in refuting the Hindu tradition. The exemplary stories might be about any kind of person or character, so why exactly are the Buddhists playing a role here? Um, before, in, before going into that question, I first want to explain to you the plot of the story uh, of the two Buddhists. Okay. Um, so in this story, the two protagonists of the Dharma Pariksha, the two Vidyadharas, Manu Vega and Pavana Vega, 
once again enter the city of Pataliputra, this time dressed up as two Buddhists, so they are Raktapata in the text. As they enter the city, they are noticed by the Brahmins who approach them to ask them who they are and if they want to discuss with them. Mano Vega, the devoted Jain of the two, tells the Brahmins they are the sons of two Buddhist laymen. Once they were protecting the clothes of Buddhist bhikshus that were lying in the sun to dry when two terrifying jackals came near. Immediately, the two sons climbed upon a stupa to flee from the jackals. However, the beasts took up the stupa and flew with it into the sky. The two sons started crying, and upon hearing their cries, the bhikshus came back outside. Immediately, the jackals went even further, this is 12 or 32 yojanas, where they let the stupa fall down underground. As they were about to devour the two sons, some hunters with dogs and weapons arrived there, scaring away the jackals. Happily saved from these frightening beasts, the two sons decided to start traveling and to become Buddhist monks themselves. Wandering around, they arrived at Pataliputra, the city of the Brahmins. Hearing this absurd story, the Brahmins do not believe the Buddhists, and they ask them to stop lying and tell them the truth. Mano Vega, dressed as a Buddhist, he reacts by asking the Brahmins why they do not believe his story, as there are also such stories to be found in the Puranas, upon which the Brahmins react that he should tell them what is so in the Puranas if they should believe him. And so then Mano Vega, Mano Vega starts telling the story of the Setu Banda from the Ramayana. Um, when Sita is abducted by Ravana to Lanka, Rama wants to get her back and therefore orders his monkey army to go to the south of India and build a bridge crossing the ocean to Sri Lanka. In order to do this, the monkeys lift up mountains and rocks very easily. And here is the parallel with the jackals who elevate the stupa. The Brahmins then realize that if they do not believe the story of the Buddhists, they should also not believe the story from their own Ramayana. And after this, Manu Vega takes Pavana Vega outside of the city and explains to him how the Brahmins and their stories are wrong. This is how the story is told in both Harishinas and Amitagati's Dharma Pariksha. From this telling, we cannot include what opinion the two authors had towards Buddhism. The story does not say anything negative about Buddhism. In the end, the two young lay Buddhists even turned towards the Buddhist way by taking Diksha themselves. So this might even seem rather positive. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> Ozie, um, who studied the Dharma Pariksha together with the Durta Kiana as uh, examples of Indian satire, he thinks that um, this setting is just a favorable setting for a marvelous story because there are also a lot of fantastic elements in Buddhist stories. Um, and also because the main plot is set in Pataliputra where there was still um, Buddhist present at the time. The use of Buddhist characters in the story might be completely neutral, although I do found it noticeable that the story comes in the end, right before a story about Shvitambaras, which is then the last story. The position and the combination of the two religious others gives the impression that the author wanted at least mention um, the religious others before ending the composition with an exposition of dharma. By mentioning these religious groups, by giving them certain characteristics, they are maybe demarcating their philosophical worlds, existing of only those others that are relevant to themselves for their own demeditation. Further, we, may, we maybe can see some mockery in here um, because the story is completely absurd. Two young Buddhists climbing stupa and then the, the stupa is lifted by two animals. It does not make any sense at all. Also, their decision to become monks after they were saved does not really have a rational base. So um, the aspect of mockery is certainly present here, but still it's not clear if it was directed towards the Buddhists or just towards the Brahmins. Overall, it's hard to draw any conclusions on the why of using Buddhist characters in the story, and we might just say that this is a just, just a short and funny story handy in um, refuting the Puranic version of the Ramayana. If both Harishena and Amitagati um, take up the story I just told in their composition, can we see some differences there? So um, the story in both texts develops in the same way and has almost 
uh, the same content. So the only differences are that in the beginning of the text, Hari Srina gives a bit more details. Um, he says that the two sons come from the city of Vikrama in the east. In uh, Hari Srina's text also, um, the jackals fly 32 yojanas away, whereas in Amitra Gatut's text, they, they, they flee 12 yojanas away further. Um, but that's it. And then style-wise, overall, it can be said that Hari Srina's text is more dynamic and it has more di quicker dialogues, whereas in Amitra Gatti's text we find a lot more um, metaphors and it feels more contemplative. Um, but this might just be a, a difference in, in language because Harishina's text is an Abhabramsha. So no, <laughs> there are no essential differences in both texts and we cannot make any other conclusions on this story from just a comparison of the two. However, a bit further in the Dharma Pariksha, we do find the relevant difference between Harishina and Amitagati related to Buddhism. In the 17th chapter of the Dharma Pariksha by Amitagati, we find a passage that directly attacks Buddhism. This passage is not found in Harishina's text and is this a personal addition by, to the plot by Amitagati. It comes right after the last of the invented stories for which the two Vidyadharas had taken on the form of Shvetambra. Where at that point, in Harishina's Dharma, Parik Dharma Pariksha, Pavana Vega asks Mano Vega an explanation of Dharma, which is the Jain Dharma. In Amitagati's Dharma Pariksha, Pavana Vega asks his friend to tell him the characteristics, the vishesham of the doctrines, Shastra of the Brahmins and others. And this is Adi. Upon this question, in Amitagati's text, Manovega first explains what aspects are wrong in the Brahmanical doctrine and then turns his criti criticism towards the Buddhists. And this is the Adi. For Manovega, Buddha's birth out of the armpit of his mother, as such breaking her body, does not show any um, compassion, but it shows that the Buddhist tradition approves of um, violence. That the Buddha eats meat also proves that there is no compassion in this tradition. He criticizes the Jataka story in which Buddha um, sacrifices himself to um, a tigress um, because she would otherwise eat of her own cubs um, because this shows that the Buddha lacks of self-control, samyama. And then Manovega attacks some doctrinal aspects of Buddhism. He says that if everything is empty, including the Buddha, how can there be the establishment of attachment and liberation? If the soul does not exist, every act rem remains meaningless. And if everything is just momentary, then nothing really exists. For these reasons, Buddha is only a fool and he cannot have omniscience. So, from this passage, it is very clear that, at least for Amitagati, he had a negative attitude towards Buddhism. He does not only find it necessary to explicitly refute the Brahmanical um, tradition, which is the overall goal of the text, he also wants to make sure his audience knows for sure that the Buddhist way is also not the one to follow. Amitagata here uses a more negative structure than uh, Harishina does, uh, who, in, who in the end wants to convince his audience of the merits of Jainism in a more positive way. Harishena seems to put more trust on the formative power of the story. And for him it is enough to ridicule the Brahmins in order to effectuate the refutability of their tradition. Amitagati, on the other hand, wants to build a rational base upon which the refutability of the Brahmins and Adi can be proved. He wants to give the audience a reason why. Furthermore, by explaining what is wrong in the other traditions, he also tells his audience what Jainism is not. In this way, he marks the borders of the Jain identity. For Amitagati, surely the Buddhists and their ideas and conducts are to be put outside of these borders. So if we think again about the earlier story of the two Buddhists, lay sons in this light, we are now sure that the story, at least for Amitagati, did not want to convey anything positive about Buddhism. And I also think for the other authors. Um, the idea that the Buddhists are mocked at through this absurd story now seems more likely. Um, however, because the, 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 the explicit refutation only comes in Amitagati's text, there is no direct link between the two, so we still cannot say this 
um, with certainty. What I do believe we can see in the usage of Buddhists in this story about the jackals and the stupa is a demarcation of the relevant philosophical world. So by naming them and giving them um, uh, some characteristics, notably at the end of the text, they are marked as a certain religious group with a definite identity. Only the mentioning of the Buddhists has some implication. One is that um, the Buddhists are a group with a definite ident identity and that it is different religious tradition. Another is that they are opposed to an us that also has a definite identity. So the author says to his audience um, something like, we are all Jains and we are not like them. Further, the story, and especially the refutation in Amitagata's text, shows that the Buddhists are still thought of in the 10th and 11th century as part of the Indian philosophical world relevant for the Digambara Jains. They are still important enough, and they still pose enough challenge to the Jain identity to argument with and to refute them. Thank you. So thank you for this very lively and most insightful presentation. Um, we still have a few minutes. Does anyone have any question on this? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yes. Why? Yeah, I, I, I've searched for this. I tried to find the same story somewhere else. I couldn't. Um, I think jackals also appear in Buddhist stories uh, sometimes, so I think maybe that's the reason why. <laughs> no? <laughs> yes? Okay. Yes. By Vrita Vilas. Yes. Uh, by name uh, Utta Vilasa. Yes. He wrote it in the year 1333. It's a beautiful Shampu Kavya. He has rendered it in a style of his own, which is very popular, very popular. But the thing is, you cannot read it. It is in Kannada. But if you want a comparison, mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that was actually one of the things I wanted to do, so thank you. <laughs> well, no, no other question. So, well, as it is no time to, to conclude our annual workshop, uh, I would like to thank uh, again all the speakers for their very uh, stimulating presentations. And I will uh, now let Peter make the final remarks. If, if. So thank you. Yes, not much to add really, except uh, again to thank all the speakers and the audience for the wonderful presentations and discussions. And uh, the remark that, of course, we are planning to, or at least offering the possibility to uh, publish the papers. And as usual in our um, the current frame, we suggest submitting papers to the IJGS, the International Journal of Jaina Studies which is published online here, and individual papers can be published as they come in. And uh, the journal is peer-reviewed, so publication is not guaranteed, but uh, I think all the papers here were ex excellent and would brilliantly fit into that journal. 
And every three years, uh, a print version of the papers that accumulated are uh, uh, published in Mumbai by Hindi Grant Karyale. Um, yes, uh, the speakers are invited for the conference dinner, which will take place at about seven, and we have to walk a little bit. Atul will maybe, possibly, thank you, accompany us. So there are at least two um, guides. It, it, it's better to, uh, for you who don't have a modern implement and can find, <laughs> you know, uh, through the map, the place to follow one of us. Thank you very much for coming, and hopefully next year we see you again.